This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week, our guest is Samantha Shahi. Some of you might know her as Sammy Flaps and Folds from Dumpster Fire. She's my beloved roommate and life partner and friend. She's also a producer of Dumpster Fire and writer, all around creative talent and genuinely loving, warm, sweet spirit. I'm really excited that I finally convinced her to come on. She's hilarious. I hope you enjoy getting to know her story a little bit more, and you'll probably be hearing more from her. I'm here with the highly requested guest, probably the most requested walk-ins welcome guest. You might know her as Sammy Flaps and Folds. <laughs> But her name is Sam Shahi. Hello. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I bullied Sam into being on. <laughs> Since we're in quarantine. Took me off the couch. I know. Sam has has made my dog fully addicted to trashy <laughs> <laughs> reality shows. <laughs> I go in there and I'm petting Hope and she's not letting me get in the way of her. She's like on her back looking at the TV Watching the TV. 90 Day Fiance. We've got to be a little specific. <laughs> I don't, I hate reality television. I feel like it all went downhill after the first year of real world. Probably. <laughs> you were like probably eight. <laughs> like, I don't remember. <laughs> were you even born? I think you were like 93. I was born. Don't insult me. I still me. think you were born in the 90s. Were you? That's sad. No. <laughs> I still have no idea. I was born in 88. Close enough, Sam. It was January of 88. And could have been, I could have been 87. And where were you born? I was born and raised in Texas. Okay. Did you know what, what, did you always know you wanted to end up in LA? No. So. Tell us your story, Sam. How did you end up here? Well, I was originally, so at a very young age, I was in a bunch of, I guess, like musical things. So I played piano, I played the drums, um, very much kind of going down that musical track. Were you a good student? Uh, I was a very good student. Did you have a choice? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. It kind of got, so when I was in kindergarten. Were your parents strict? My mom was. Yeah. Um, she was a single parent or is a single parent, was. Is, and she, she's not. She's, you're, you're, she's an immigrant. You're second generation. No, I'm first generation. Is it is that what how it works? I, yeah. I always get confused. I had to Google it. I'm first generation. Okay. Yeah. If I have kids, they're they second. second generation. Okay. Right. So first generation kid in Texas. And in kindergarten, I was trying to make people laugh. So whenever we went to the bathroom, I would turn on the faucet, stick my hand under it, get everybody wet. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> they were like, that girl's so they annoying. Yeah. <laughs> the girl with the frizzy hair made us all wet. So anyways, my mom came, told me she didn't leave her country to raise a bad child. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally see your mom saying that. <laughs> eh, sorry, mom. But after that, then I was like, oh, no, I can't. I can't mess up. My mom left her entire family and I'm like making other people wet. You're like the so, class clown. Pretty much. And then that just. You could away. have been one of those stand up comedians that, you know, like Aziz and all the people who are like whose parents are highly disappointed in them <laughs> because they're first generation and all their stand up is about how they're like, my parents wanted me to be a doctor and now I'm telling jokes. My mom wants me to be a lawyer. <laughs> you would be a great lawyer. I hate the law. Yeah, but you're really good at it. Well, thank you. As I think it's Mike Rowe. Isn't he the guy who's all about finding a job that's practical? He's the guy that does like the hard oh, jobs. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Di Dirty jobs. Dirty jobs. He was my brother's. All about like being trade. Yeah, trade my brother school. didn't have very many like male role models who weren't at all. And then the ones were pretty white collar, I think. Mm-hmm. And he was so like alpha and kind of just like a dude's dude and never really wanted to go to college. And so Mike was kind of his like 
dad figure and he learned everything you know that's why he went and like was a deep sea fisherman and right but his whole thing is the idea of like chasing your dreams is stupid (laughs) i mean if you think about it it is stupid (laughs) yeah but you have to really want your as soul cycle instructor once told me oh boy sam and and i (laughs) sam and i have to tell the story of where we met too (laughs) A soul cycle instructor once told me if you can wrap your head around your dreams, you're not dreaming big enough. Wait, I don't get it. <laughs> Dream bigger, Brit. <laughs> I, I don't get if it. If your dream can be easily attainable, you need to dream bigger. Oh. That's I that's what I mean how I took what she said. She's an Olympic athlete. <laughs> And like a knife, a Nike ambassador and a Lululemon ambassador. And, and like Oprah's buddy. Would, wouldn't you want to be Oprah's buddy? Yeah, but she, I think what, it's kind of like that joke that I used to tell all the time about how in The Secret, you know, they, they're they like, all you have to do is just think of, like imagine, what? envision getting checks in the mail. If you want to write a book, just imagine the checks coming in the mail. First of all, <laughs> checks don't come in the mail anymore, but we'll just leave that aside. And nobody really taught, I mean, Angela does, that soul mm-hmm. cycle instructor. I think she does, she does point out that in between the checks coming in the mail and you envisioning it, you have to write the fucking book. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's easy to be like, you just need to like dream bigger. But if you're not actually doing anything, you have to do the steps. You're delusional. Yeah. (laughs) You can't be like, I'm going to be an Olympic athlete. An Olympic athlete. Well, you eat potato (laughs) chips and wake up at 11. (laughs) And you never leave your couch. No. Yeah. So it's interesting because, you know, from a practical standpoint, like your your mother's perspective, it would make more sense for you to become a lawyer because at least then you always have money and theoretically a job. Right. Whereas pursuing it's the like, creative path is the most uncertain path in the world for yeah. idiots. But she's <laughs> also been very supportive about that too. She has been. Yeah. And... Was she always supportive of you in the arts? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, so because she was a single parent, she, you know, our, you know, at least mine, because me and my siblings were all kind of eight years apart, uh-huh. our daycare, my daycare was extracurricular activities. Right. So it was going to piano class. It was going to karate. It was going to oh, swimming lessons. I want videos <laughs> of little Sam and karate. <laughs> Probably not good. <laughs> Are they as funny as your tap dancing videos from your late 20s? <laughs> from like two years ago. <laughs> probably, probably. Um, so yeah, so I was like a super heavy band nerd. I mean, what Tracy Flick was in election was yeah. me and band. That's so cute. Or like the girl Rachel and Glee, Lee Michelle's character in Glee was me, but in marching band. Do you have video of you in marching band? I might. We need to get some of that <laughs> to put it in dumpster fire. Oh boy! <laughs> and here's you played him. the drums, right? I played the drums, so wow. I was so yeah. So I was a music major. Well, okay, let's backtrack a bit. So I did music, <laughs> fell in love with it, and then whenever I went to college, I knew I wanted to go into music school. Where'd you go to school? So I went to the University of North Texas. Okay, which for people who aren't familiar with it, it's one of the top music schools in the country. I found out that year that I got accepted, I was the only girl drummer. So I thought that was pretty awesome. That is awesome. Um, So I went there. I was a music major. And I was a music major for about two years. So my freshman and sophomore year. Uh Then during that time, every summer, every spring break, I'd fly out to LA to visit my sister. When did your sister move here? My sister moved out here in 2000, I believe. So from 2000 up until... I guess pretty much up until I moved out here, which was 2011. Yeah. So for 11 years, I'd come out in the summer and spring break and I'd visit my sister and brother-in-law, go on set, see everything. And I thought it was really cool. Yeah. And so then my transition from wanting to be a music teacher, I wanted to originally teach, then kind of went to, okay, well, maybe I'll conduct. Then that turned into, well, actually really like 
film and TV, so maybe I'll compose and I'll try it again to composition. So then I started taking some music theory classes. Music theory is hard. It's really hard. It's like math. It (laughs) it pretty much is. It's so hard. (laughs) I do not like it. No, it's Um, really challenging. And then I realized how hard that was. Yeah. And then, but I kept leaning more and more and more onto the film and TV side. So then it wasn't until one day my mom was kind of like, if you want to do film and TV, then why are you still a music major? Uh, it's like, you're really smart, mom. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. So then I switched my major and I turned my I turned my original music major into a minor. And so I minored in music and okay. then I minored in women's studies. And then I got my major in film and TV. Okay. And why did you minor in women's studies? So when I was... <laughs> <laughs> good, good question. So when I was a music major and you had to take different electives, uh-huh. I this is really bad. So me being a good student, I found that the women's studies classes were the easiest. <laughs> were the easiest ones <laughs> because you know it, it, everything was just kind of subjective and it's from your theory. opinion and yeah. it's theory. So. If I could at least defend my opinion on something, then I got an A. Mm, so, because- <laughs> very crafty, Sam. This is only proving the point that this gender is- <laughs> studies is a fucking bullshit major and you don't learn anything like, relevant. This is why I'm a producer. Yeah. But so then I was like, okay, I'll do that. So I started taking those classes. I was getting A's and I was like, all right, well, this is easy. And so then I just kind of kept doing it. And then <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. I've been wondering for like six years why you had a gender studies major. Like, I'm like why is this girl from Texas? Because <laughs> I am a nerd. Yeah. So then I see all of that. And so then after I'm trying to figure out, you know, how many hours do I have? Can I graduate? Can I not? Because I had already spent at this point two years focusing on one certain major that now I'm no longer doing. And then I found out, it's like, oh, okay, I actually have, if I take one more class, it's a minor and I'm done. Oh, okay. And so then I was like, all right, might as well toss that in. And what were the classes you had to take? Oh, gosh. I don't want to throw it completely under the bus. And I'm curious because I was joking the other day that I was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez when I was like 27. Mm -hmm. I understand her mentality because when I was bartending, I I feel like you were kind of her even when I first met you. Um, no, I I I had I had already started the eye-opening transition. (laughs) I was way worse in my 20s, and we're all kind of like crazy liberals in our 20s. I think so. Mm -hmm. Were you into the gender studies? I actually kind of were you was. like a woke kind of college kid. Um, I mean, I went to the the university was in a town called Denton, mm-hmm. which is a very liberal, like far left town, and just and because it was also kind of like an art school, right? You know, it was already very that, progressive. Yeah, yeah, it was already kind of in that way. But the classes that I kind of took, it was like intro to feminism. Mm -hmm. You know, there are different classes on the different waves of feminism. There is a women's health class. There was kind of, it was everything, just kind of the history pretty much of women and feminism and gender studies. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm sure I would actually kind of like to take a women's studies class now just to see how much it's differed. Right. From what I took in like 2006. Yours was probably but. more the old school, I would I would gather. I don't know that critical theory had, well, I mean, you would know, had critical theory infected like intersectionality and all no. that? Was that? So the idea, yeah. so intersectionality, I feel like that's still kind of a fairly new-ish thing. I remember just briefly kind of touching up on it, but the main things that we, kind of really focus on or that I remembered being the most recent or current was the third wave feminism. Right. And now it's fourth wave, right? Now it's kind of fourth wave. The intersectional. Okay. And at that point, it hadn't really, it was just kind of coming up to the surface. And what was third wave's primary? First wave was like voting. Right. And women's suffrage. Right. Second wave was in the 60s. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then what was the third third wave? The third wave was more in the 90s. And that was more around 
like sexuality? Yeah. Okay. Even though that was still kind of brushed 60s. up a bit in the 60s, yeah. but it was kind of more so in the 90s. Okay. And then... And like LGBTQ, because okay. there's been kind of some, I guess, like disagreements between the second and the third wave, just because the second wasn't as progressive as the... You know, each wave is more progressive than the last. Right. And because the third wave then kind of focused a little bit more on LGBTQ, and the second wave didn't that much. Right. And now intersectional is more about the power structures. Yes. With the different races and the genders. Disabilities. And, and, yeah. Okay. Interesting. I. It's interesting because I feel like you fell in the gap between the two. You know, you were kind of on the tail end of critical theory right before it changed into what it is today. Yeah. So if you had been a little bit younger, you would be more like the people I see online who are like in 20, I guess like five right now. That's cool. It's cool. I I didn't go to college and I really, I think I just parroted li- liberal talking points and didn't really put much thinking into it and have talked about that a lot. But there is something about being a bartender and being in the weight, being in the like restaurant industry, which what we're seeing even now, you're kind of the first, you're just the least regarded. Right. It's like you, you don't have health insurance. You don't have a union. You don't yeah. have any protection and you're working all the time, crazy hours. And in, I mean, one place that I worked at used to make us come in early and clean for two eighty nine dollars an hour, which is illegal. And I was yeah. always yelling at the top of my lungs that this is not legal. And I think that it makes you also when you're bartending, you're seeing all the downtrodden folks who are drinking and hearing their <laughs> stories. Yeah. And so it makes you feel that in, injustice on a daily basis. You want to fight for the people, Brit. Yeah. And I was always waiting on rich people, too, which drove me insane. Right. So I think you, if you're depending on where you are and what you're doing, it gives you that kind of perspective of like, like AOC. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I understand. I, I I understand that perspective. Like you get it. You get I it. do. But I also think that I'll, it'll be interesting to see her evolution over time. Oh, totally. Because she's so young. And Candace Owens too. All these people that I'm like, they're 20. Candace Owens is like 25. Or 26 or something. And AOC is like 29 now. I mean, they're young. They're going to be like, whoa. Can't, can't take those words back. <laughs> Stuff's going to haunt you guys forever. That's when you just say, I was in my 20s. Yeah. I didn't mean what I said. So you ended up getting Oh, yeah. Your so I got my degree. And then I moved out here the to LA the following year. We've had the whole family on now. You've had the whole family. So for people who want to hear Sam's sister's story... She was one of our very early guests on Walk In Welcome, and she had a bit of a charmed experience coming to <laughs> L.A. It's like the red carpet was just rolled out for her. <laughs> she's telling her story. She's like, and then this happened, and then that happened, and it just seems like she came out and was one of those people that just thrived in the industry, and the industry loved her. Mm-hmm. And do you think that that made it, seeing your sister's success, and having that enough of a gap made it maybe more acceptable for you to chase that dream. I think so. Like she, um, p- I think it was also, yeah. I mean, so kind of backtracking. So whenever I was coming out here and I was visiting and I was kind of going through my progression of like, well, what do I want to do? What mm-hmm. do I want to be when I grow up? And going to set, and there's a little area on like any set called Video Village, mm-hmm. and that's where like the producers are, the director is, you know, they have the, the monitors, they're looking at what's going on. And I would always go to Video Village and, you know, and I'd like shadow a director, I'd shadow a producer. And I was talking to somebody one day and I was like, well, who are like, who are those people, you know, under that tent over there? And they're like, oh, that's video. You know, they described it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I was like, well, what does the producer do? And they're like, oh, well, they... They're, you know, they like write the checks, mm. you know, they're signing the checks. They're kind of in charge of everything. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And so that's then kind of when I was like, aha, 
So then kind of having that idea and then knowing, okay, I'm now in film school. I want to be a producer. I'm coming out here. My sister and brother-in-law are now, you know, they're already actors. They're established. I feel like I guess to answer your question, like, yeah, like I did think like, okay, this is possible. This is, yeah. you know, but I also kind of had super lofty goals that then in my mind, I was like, oh, 25, I'll be married and I'll be a billionaire or not a billion, a millionaire. Yeah. And that obviously didn't happen. Yeah. <clears throat> but it definitely, you know, it did kind of help me and get my foot in the door. Right. You know, because then I had an internship and then I got my first job working with Craig Ferguson. And what was and that job with Craig Ferguson? So back when he had the Late Late Show on CBS, he had his own production company called Green Mountain West. Okay. And so his production company was just me and the woman who ran his company. Yeah. And it was just the two of us and then Craig every now and then. And then that then kind of got my foot started into the comedy path. Okay. Um, so then it was just like going to comedy shows all the time, uh, meeting with, you know, writers, working on, you know, helping them develop their pitches and giving them notes on everything. And then after he left, then my job hopping kind of started. Yeah, I feel like you represent to, to me the another industry that's overlooked and abused like waitresses and it's the assistant industry oh, and yeah. god the stuff i've heard from you and your friends and the uh, just stories you've told me through other people that you know it is in Saying again, it's an industry not regulated. Yeah, no union. There's no union. No one's Writers protected. I think have a union now. Yeah, but they're. I feel like they're one rung up from yeah. just assistance. But yeah, I mean Hollywood assistants. I feel really they get I really abused. feel for them because I've had some really great bosses. Yeah, and I've had some really not so great bosses. Yeah. Um, but each one I've learned from all of them. Yeah, you know, it still seems like a very I don't know. I'm glad to see that there's this movement online of people kind of speaking up about the way assistants are. I feel like recently there's been a lot of chatter about the way oh, assistants yeah, are there treated. Was, there was someone, I forget who it was, but she kind of started this whole like assistant speaking up movement and then different other producers started kind of speaking up at, about it and just yeah. being like, we're going to pay our assistants more because there are a lot of people, there are assistance at agencies and management companies that they're getting paid maybe like $13 an hour, $14 right. an hour, you know, but then they're expected to work on the weekends and oh, they're it's expected, insane. yeah, and they're working 17 hour days. Yeah. And that is kind of the nature of the industry where you do have long hours, but also it's kind of, you know, I feel like the, your lower rung people, your staff, you want to treat them well if you want them to do well. And it's just, it's another kind of disposable. You know, there's a, yeah. it's the, it's there's got, always someone else who'll do the job easily. cheaper. Yeah. And it's also just another, it's like waiting tables. It's another, it's one of those jobs where it's lower skill in terms of you don't need that many skills to do it. You can be easily replaced and you aren't really protected. You're a punching bag for like all of humanity. Oh, or yeah. in your in assistance cases, like one individual in a lot of cases, yeah, and take bear the brunt of everybody's kind of wrath, yeah. And it's just I always look at how people treat their assistants or their wait staff because I think that they're the they take they're those people. But even right now today, as we're talking, these are all the jobs and people who are fucked right now. Oh yeah, like you don't have severance. You're not getting if you're in a if you it's so good that you're in a you know different again position than you were right which is probably because you're in a law firm now <laughs> um, mom mama knows best and it's just interesting how when I was teaching yoga or all those jobs you get in times like this people just freeze their money and they get rid of cut all the fat like all yeah. the luxury items so. Yeah. If you're a celebrity whose show shuts down and you still want to keep that that maintain that high cost of living and now suddenly the money isn't coming in mm -hmm. and you can't afford your assistant or nanny nanny's another one. I yeah. mean nannies are getting so screwed. Private personal instructors, all mm -hmm. the people that you're paying 
regularly and who depend on you and you're like yeah. shut down and then don't pay them it's yeah. so messed up it's crazy it is and that entire population is so is struggling right now in la i don't yeah. think we have any idea how many people are i think another i even just yesterday if any it was any indication in one of the you know meetings i was in in zoom three of the women were talking about how they laid off hundreds of people or furloughed people yeah. people, and they're all in LA. Yeah. So there's a whole other round happening right yeah. now. Well, it's like, and you think of entertainment too. It's, you know, you've got a TV show, you've got a movie, you have PAs, you've got so many gigs. All You've got so many different people yeah, that, it, you know, it's like artists. you just watch the credits run at after the end of something and you see all the people that are now affected. Yeah. Even I, I was talking to somebody and they might come on. He's in the music industry and mm -hmm. all of those. I mean, the makeup artists, this, the crew, the the grips, the guys who are, you know, all yeah. the it's so many in entertainment. Just those, there's so many gig yeah. people. Craft service. Yeah. Crafty. Yeah. I don't I know. I can't keep all that food out. It's nuts. It's crafty. nuts. And I, I think that what I like about that experience, you know, I, I try to take some, I think it gives you a insight into this experience from the kind of common person. Mm -hmm. Cause we keep hearing like, we're all in this together. And it's like, no, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. I'm even not to a certain extent that other people aren't, right. you know, I, I'm okay. I live on still like the razor's edge, but I'm not, if I was a nanny who had a kid and no safety net at all, right? what are you going to do? Exactly. So, I mean, I weirdly felt like the economy was going to crash. So I, I luckily like put a little away, but it's not, most people aren't even able to save in America. Yeah. So when I see celebrities talking about <laughs> like these things where they're like, Tim Dillon did the funniest video where he was like all celebrities right now. And he's like, we're all in this <laughs> yeah. together. And he's like in his pool. It's like huge and backyard. He's like, I've had no one here. And there's a maid in the background. <laughs> yeah. I'm so Even alone. cleaning ladies. What are they yeah. doing? That's what I think too about this situation is it's so frustrating because you'll hear people talking about the um, who's affected. And mm -hmm. it's the poorest people who are struggling right yeah. now. It's 85 here today. It's not people with pools and yeah. yards who are hurting. It's people who are in the inner city. Yeah. My friend was saying that he was talking to somebody and, you know, they closed all the basketball courts and he's like, I've just been sitting around drinking because that's all I can do. And I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. <laughs> drinking? <laughs> well, just how don't many people, because they don't have outlets that they normally yeah. have, especially if you live in an urban yeah. part of the city. Well, and that's also kind of something too that this coronavirus has done. It's like it's making everybody, everything that you would normally kind of go run away to, it's kind of bringing up. Yeah. You know, and then you either face your demons and try to work through it and yeah. confront it or you don't. It's a lot of time with your own mind. Oh, yeah. Did So in your job hopping how many years yeah. of job hopping after ferguson okay so i was at ferguson for almost three years mm -hmm. um i would have stayed at that job forever i loved it so yeah. much then i went and i worked in reality tv for a year yeah that was fun because um, you're a foodie because i'm a foodie so i worked on cutthroat kitchen for That's like amazing. four seasons that was we were living together at that point and <laughs> sam was getting just like free cutting boards free food <laughs> from the end of the week she'd come up with boxes of food <laughs> like and bridget we, i'm making lobster and scallops and tonight. we were so poor it was <laughs> like that job like fed us it's really wonderful it i miss really that was. job too um, worked on Cutthroat Kitchen, worked on a, another cooking show on Bravo called mm -hmm. Recipe for Deception. Um, I produced a pilot for a comedy show called Comedy Knockout on True TV. I was there for a year. Mm -hmm. And then I hopped again. Because at that point, reality was great, but I was afraid I was going to get too stuck. Pigeonhole yeah. is like, a, yeah, that's the thing about this town. They want to know what lane you're in. Exactly. And I've been everywhere. So <laughs> everybody's kind of like, uh. <laughs> and they don't know what to do with you. And I'm like, no, I just know everything now. Yeah. Um. So then 
after I left uh, the reality world, I went and I worked at another production company, which is no longer kind of like in business now. Mm -hmm. But that was a feature company. Mm -hmm. So the shows or the films that we did were like Suspiria, House with a Clock in Its Walls. Mm -hmm. There's another movie I can't remember. It was like White House Down, Black Swan. Like they produced and did all of those shows, uh, those movies. And so I was there up until pretty much like that company Mm -hmm. closed down. Then I went to an entertainment law firm um, just because I needed a job. Mm -hmm. And that was the only place prior that, you know, like all my other jobs were pretty show heavy. Right. Which is also really tough because the minute a show ends, then you're out of a job. Or the minute a company that's pretty much based around a show ends, then you're still out of a job. So this was kind of like my first stable job working in an office and it was entertainment adjacent and I did not like it because I'm a creative person right so then at that point then I kind of started getting into writing Mm -hmm. and then just trying to look for another job then I landed at another company Mm -hmm. called Girl Gaze Mm -hmm. and it was kind of female photography focused and creative yeah and i was there a little shy of a year Mm -hmm. and then landed at my current job and looking back talking you know this podcast all about resilience and grit what have you learned from where you saw yourself versus the reality of how it's played out oh boy you know, timelines are a fallacy. Yeah. You know, I think from my first moving out here thinking I'm going to be a millionaire and married by 25. I thought the same thing. Not married, that, but a millionaire. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, I don't want to get married. <laughs> You're like, but uh, I still want to be a millionaire. <laughs> but I still, yeah. We could even put a B in front yeah. of it. Yeah. millionaire. Um, you know, it's one of those things now, you know, going on the resilience thing that you know, time, it, you know, look, like it took Julia Roberts, what, like 14 years for her to finally be like an overnight success. And mm-hmm. that was what from Mystic Pizza that her brother did. She filmed you that know? in our hometown. Oh, really? And my mom said that woman's going to be a huge star when she was just around town. Wow. She called it. She was like, that woman is going to be a huge star. Can your mom tell me about me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll have to get her. <laughs> I just remember when they were filming that we were living in Mystic. Wow. And so they were all over and that was the first time I had ever like seen a movie star and she wasn't really even like a huge movie star but my mom was like, "Oh no, that woman's going to be huge." That's insane. Yeah. I, I love that. I think the movie. first movie the first famous person I ever saw was Leanne Rhymes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like in person? In person. Okay. Bathroom of a TGI Fridays. Wow, was she puking? She She had just performed at like the Grand Prairie Grand Ole Opry. Uh And my sister had just performed that night too there. What was she doing? (laughs) In the bathroom? No, your sister. She was singing. Oh. Yeah, my sister was a singer. I totally never never got that part of the story. She was was like in show choir. Oh, wow. So she was in show choir. I was in marching band. I knew she was a like cheerleader, but I don't mm-hmm. remember her talking about cheerleader was in college. Okay, yeah, because they were on SNL. Okay, so yeah, that was my first. Wow, that was my first celebrity I saw. Oh yeah, but going back to your question, yeah. sorry. You know, it's like time you got to get that out of your head. Yeah, you know, I think we all. I feel like from such a young age, and I don't know if this is true, maybe with boys and men, but I feel like for girls. It's very much kind of like you want to have this by this age. You want this by this age. You want Mm -hmm. that. And so I just thought, okay, well, that's kind of how it's going to be career wise, too. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to L.A., you work for a few years, you finally get, you know, whatever it is. And Mm -hmm. then, boom, you're there. Yeah. And, you know, that did happen. But the only thing that's pretty much stayed true the entire time was just my love for film and TV Mm -hmm. and producing. Yeah. It's like, that's what I do. Yeah. You're really good at it. Thank you. I get the job done. Yeah. You're organized too. Oh, yeah. I'm very type A. Yeah. Which is definitely, I still, I want you to tell the story (laughs) of when you were a child at your birthday party. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Okay. So I had a bunk bed. 
Because I feel like it really reveals how type A you are. <laughs> oh boy, I had a I had a bunk bed, and uh, on my top bunk, I had all of my stuffed animals. <laughs> I put them all lined up, and like you know, from tallest to smallest, and they were all lined up, you know, against like the wall. And it was my birthday, and all my friends came over, and we were all playing in my room, and they go up on the bunk, and then they start taking all my toys. <laughs> And so for me, I'm like, okay, like I'm displaying, like I'm showing you, like, look at my nice toys, not touch my toys. So they all go up, they grab my toys, they start playing with them, all my stuffed animals, they throwing, they're throwing them all across the room. I'm just like crying. (laughs) How old were you? I was maybe, I was probably, I don't know, like. Seven. Seven, yeah. I guess. And then I just started crying. And I was like, you're ruining my room. You're ruining my birthday. Leave, leave. And my mom's like, let your friends play. And I'm like, they're ruining my toys. I cleaned my room. Sam kicked everyone out of her party. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, but I think you have to be a big, you know, the the gift of most, I, I f- from my limited experience, really great producers have an ability to have a big picture focus and also crazy attention to detail oh yeah it's like a weird mix of a personality yeah because usually like me (laughs) go on my computer gives sam anxiety Uh, it really does. I'm, I was so ashamed. I mean, Sam's seeing me at my worst. <laughs> she knows every dark secret I have, all the most shameful things I've ever done, anything that I could be ashamed of, and I would not show her my compu- <laughs> my desktop <laughs> because I know. I'm like, I'm too ashamed, Sam. I start twitching. <laughs> I'm too ashamed. Because <laughs> it is just like my, my brain explodes onto my devices. It's just how, and I'm... I am that kind of classically disorganized creative. That's why like I half the time I just don't even want to touch your computer when you're like, can you print out the thing? You're like, no. <laughs> and I'm just like, no, I can't. <laughs> I the anxiety starts to it. overwhelm me. <laughs> and I'm so ashamed that Sam's offered to help me organize it, but I won't even let her look at it to help me. Countless be- times. Because I'm too ashamed of how disorganized I am. It's something I'm so, so embarrassed about. <laughs> It's just ridiculous. But it it's also made you a great assistant, almost too good. And too good. yeah, and you've been doing it so long. It's like second nature. And I, I am like a just moron when it comes to that stuff. I don't have that brain. Mm-hmm. Or even if I did, I like it when things are organized, but I don't want to organize them. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't want, if I have to choose between writing for an hour right. or organizing my emails, I'm always going to write because I feel like that's what I should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> As a writer, yes, you should be doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But it's also, you know, representative of some of the bigger character defects. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Betacy.com is an online gated community. The pool's going in next year. Above all else, Betacy values freedom, freedom of expression, freedom to laugh in the face of life's darkest moments, freedom to make mistakes, freedom from the masks we wear to hide our pain, our suffering, and our insecurities. We want the Phetasy community to be a place where people can drop these masks and inspire others to do the same, a place where we bring out the best in each other, where uncertainty is allowed and differing opinions are respected, a community of people more interested in discovering what they are for rather than what they are against, a place where we can be challenged and as a result, grow, take risks, face our demons and laugh while the world burns. If you want to join the Phetasy community, it's $5 a month. And if you are one of our listeners and you want to sign up now, we're offering two months free if you enter the promo code FETASY when you go to FETASY.com and sign up. That's promo code FETASY, P-H-E-T-A-S-Y, when you go to FETASY.com. Sign up now, join our community, engage with others, share some memes, laugh, and get exclusive access to Dumpster Fire, walk-ins, welcome, outtakes, 
writings, journal entries, and pictures of Bridget's dog, Hope. So how has it been? How long have you been in LA now? Nine years. Nine years. Mm -hmm. Sam and I met when I rescued her from a cult. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) I was not in a cult. (laughs) She wasn't in a cult, but it's a more fun story. I was... I was um, working at Ferguson. I was in a very dark place. Mm-hmm. I had recently got sober, still waitress, waiting tables mm-hmm. at Vita. And I just could not get out of this depression. And I kept thinking, like, I should chant. I should chant. I mm-hmm. should chant. And I don't know why that came into my head. And then I waited on these two Indian women. And I don't even know how we got to talking about it, probably because... It's a cult and they're always looking for new people. I don't think I was the one who brought up that I wanted to chant randomly to my table I was waiting on. They just sensed that I was... Bridget, our they sensed today I, was are. A, <laughs> I was a broken person. They're like, we've Existential got one. Existential dread. We've got <laughs> and grilled one. grilled cheese. <laughs> we've got one. And they told me to go and I went and little Sam was leading I the was chanting. Leading a Buddhist meeting. Yeah. yeah. I actually really liked it, but I just didn't like how aggressive they were. Yeah. Like I like I the I that. love the practice. Yeah. If I could divorce the practice from the like calling and aggressively kind of promoting it. Um You can. You then just yeah. Practice for yourself. Yeah. But I also you know? need to be held accountable, which is why going to things is good. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I'm again like, I don't I don't, I don't know it enough either. Other it's the Nam Kyo, right? Yeah, yeah, Nam Kyo. And what does that mean? It means um my mom used to do this yeah it's the tina turner buddhism i feel like you know how all of those guys like joel Osteen. it's yeah. like prosperity gospel yeah yeah it almost feels like prosperity buddhism because mm-hmm. you chant for things you want right well because of the whole per okay so basically what nam yoho renge kyo means mm-hmm. is i the loose translation of it is like i dedicate myself to the mystical law of cause and effect through sound so the whole mm-hmm. idea is that you are you're voicing, you're vocalizing what it is that you want. So that's uh, the sound. So as opposed to thinking about it or praying for it, which I think like the root meaning of prayer is to beg. Okay. Is that this isn't, you aren't begging for it. You're demanding. You're you're telling the universe like, this is what I want. <laughs> you're like, excuse me. But for every. <laughs> you're like the Karen. <laughs> excuse me, universe. Excuse me, universe. <laughs> I am the manager and I am telling you. I need to talk to the manager. <laughs> Listen, I, God. That would be a really funny stand up routine. That would be, <laughs> like, be a funny sketch. I'm yodeling at Kyo. It's just like all Karens <laughs> demanding to talk to the manager of the universe. Um, excuse me. For every cause, there is an effect. <laughs> Your bad service. <laughs> <laughs> has led me to make some decisions I am not proud of and I want something different. <laughs> so if you do not mind, I am demanding. Give it to me. That you send me a $100 <laughs> check in the mail. <laughs> so but, I did like it though. What yeah. I do like about it from my very limited experience was that it shuts my fucking brain up Yeah, because I'm focused on the repetitious chanting. Right, right. And that was the same when I was on ashrams and we did the morning practice of chanting. Mm-hmm. Um, the, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on what it's called? Um, It'll come to me. And we did it every morning and that was the same thing where it was the, the kirtan mm. where you're just repeating, repeating, repeating and you get into that almost trance-like state because your brain just like, it short circuits that loop in your mind. Yeah, yeah. So I loved that because it's not very many things other than drugs, heroin. And chanting. <laughs> <laughs> Meditating sometimes, yeah. but it's like one minute. It'll yeah. be a fleeting second where I have that quiet. But right. with Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, it was extended periods of quiet. Yeah. Well, and because it's, you know, in, in regular silent meditations, it's hard to shut your brain up. Right. You know, but then whenever you're chanting for something, even if you're chanting for nothing, even if you're like, I'm just going to sit and say these words and look at the wall for right. five minutes, you're going to feel different. Right. And your brain isn't really going to, you know, float around everywhere. Mm -hmm. But then kind of the whole point when they're like, you know, chant for something you want is because ultimately the whole key for this sect of Buddhism, 
which is Nitram Buddhism, is it just world peace? And, okay. And so it's like, in order to kind of attain that, it's let's break that down to the smallest little thing where it's mm-hmm. okay, you want this. So then just chant for that. And mm-hmm. you're either going to get that or you're going to get something better. Mm-hmm. And then whenever you do get that, then you have the proof of it. Mm-hmm. Then you're going to be like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I got this. And I'm happy, so I want to go and share that with somebody else. Right. And so then you kind of do that. And it's like, I've had positive experiences with it. Like, so why aren't you a millionaire, Sam? <laughs> Have you not been chanting it's hard not, enough? Probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's actually very hard. It's so hard to sustain yeah. saying four words. Yeah. Any, but, any of these, any But practice. it's like, look, like I was up for a job working with Harvey Weinstein. I was chanting like five hours a day my ass off to get that job. I didn't get it. I cried my eyes out. And I remember being like, you're going to be glad. <laughs> Rejection is the universe's protection. Exactly. Karen had my back. Yeah. And <laughs> God is now Karen. God is now Karen. No, no, God isn't Karen. God is the manager Karen needs to talk to. Yeah. I was Karen. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, Karen was on the wrong. But, and so now obviously like I'm super grateful. Yeah. You know, I never got that job. Yeah. But, you know, it's like things like that, you know, but it's like I have done things where it's like I had, a you know, one of my jobs, I was going to go to New York and then I wasn't going to go to New York. And then I was just kind of determined of like, no, I'm going to go to New York and I'm just going to chant for this. And I chanted for it. And the week before my boss was going to New York, she was like, she texted me and she goes, I'm so sorry, but I need you to come with me to New York. Can you buy a plane wow. ticket? And do you still chant? I do every now and then, not yeah. as often as I should. Yeah. Just in terms of like having a daily practice. But I do find in times when I get way too in my head and I just need to kind of like mellow out. Yeah. Then I will go and do it. Yeah. That's cool. How did you find it? I found it through one of my friends. Her name's Cameron. Mm-hmm. And she used to be an executive at Fox. And then now she's a producer. And her and I, she was like one of the very first friends I met uh, or I made when I moved out here to L.A. And she helped me get the job at Ferguson, all that stuff. And she one day was just kind of like, hey, I do this thing. Like, if you want to come to a meeting, because she was asking me, she was like, how are you? And I was like, oh, you know, like, I'm kind of struggling. I don't really know what to Mm do. You know, I kind of feel a little bit lost spiritually. And she was like, why don't you come? Mm -hmm. I'm like, "Okay." And so I came and. You know, I kind of had a similar experience you did. Like, I felt like a lot of people were really kind of pushing it on me. And then I was just like, you know what? I was like, let me do it at my speed. Mm-hmm. And so I tried it out for like three months. And oh, then nice. I was like, okay, no, yeah, I do like this. I want to yeah. do this. There is something. You seem like you. it's kind of like me when I'm going to a lot of meetings. I feel I'm better. Yeah. I just feel better. I've been going to a lot of meetings this week. I feel better. That's like not a weird yeah. coincidence it's kind of like it helps you polish your mirror right? yeah so it's like you may have a mirror and you think it's good and then you start spraying windex on it and then it kind of gets a little bit murky and you're like oh this isn't nice yeah but then once you really get through it then you're like oh it's shiny and now yeah. i can really see things yeah and that's kind of the process of it it's like sometimes i'll just i'll sit down and chant and then i just start crying and i feel like everything around me is horrible but then all of a sudden like i see the little glimmer of hope and then that's what you attach onto. Yeah. And then things start getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Now, how has, so you talked about being a millionaire and being married. Mm-hmm. How has your, your, your dating stories are legendary. They we really almost, are. we almost need to do an entirely separate podcast where you tell all of your dating stories. Oh, Cause My we don't need stories. We don't are... have enough time on this one and it deserves its own special podcast (laughs) (laughs) because sam has like i don't know i've never known my picker's broken (laughs) i don't know it's so funny and maybe it's the weird personality and i don't mean that i mean that lovingly it's the weird how we always joke about how you're like a member of the greatest generation when i come home sometimes sam's knitting and watching an old time prohibition documentary which is amazing by the way burns is great yeah but I think you... That was after a date, too. Yeah, <laughs> it was. I don't know that um, modern men appreciate you because you're not... You're, like, goofy and smart. I don't know that the it modern is, it L.A. Is kind man... kind of a little bit... Yeah. 
Maybe it's because just it's LA. like what? Like I'm not going to sleep with you on our first, second, yeah, third, fourth. You're kind of old fashioned. You know, it's like I'm old fashioned in that way. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, I am goofy and funny and weird. But mm-hmm. at the same time, it's like I'm a homebody and I want to cook. Like that's how I sh- express my, you know, that's how I like show that I appreciate you. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. It's like, I don't know. But I also feel like, you know, L.A., it's like take the top, the 20 hottest people of your school and put them all in a city. And then that's who you're kind of competing with and i just think that men have so many options yeah and it's such a just throwaway culture and i think it's also the apps too yeah you know you meet somebody on an app you text you have like great texting chemistry yeah but then you're also meeting a bunch of other people on the app yeah you know so if one starts to fizzle out then you just go to the next one yeah do you feel optimistic or do you feel how do you feel about your dating life i'm okay yeah i'm just like okay I'm like yeah. if it comes it comes if it doesn't it doesn't i think at times i've wanted things so badly yeah but now i'm just kind of at a point that i'm like okay like this is me you're gonna be you i feel like when i was right around your age actually it's so funny you know that what the mind can do to us oh yeah. the other morning i woke up and i had a nice thought about someone else that I was excited for. And then immediately my brain was like, you're fat, you're ugly, you're childless, and you're a late bloomer. You're never going to have children. What are you doing? You're basically like a high school. It was like I was joking the other day. I'm like, it was a hate crime. Like, oh my, God. <laughs> my brain should have been arrested. And it does do that. And I love what you said about how there's, you know, you have to let go of the timeline. Yeah. And I, oh, you in particular always remind me watching you grow and mature and we've been living together for like five years now six yeah, years. Five years and we've been through a lot yeah. both of us individually in our lives while mm-hmm. we've been living together and so i've seen you go through hell and job transitions and unemployment mm-hmm. and deaths and all oh, kinds yeah. of shit and you just always have the most loving, upbeat spirit. You're going to make me cry. You maintain that, though. It's hard to maintain and not become cynical, and now, especially I mean, in L.A. I definitely have cynical thoughts. I mean, God, I the other... <laughs> I'm like, like, thank you for complimenting me. Now let me prove you You're wrong. Like, Here comes the hate crime. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like, you know, it's like I feel like everybody kind of has, you know, their own, their own thing, but it's like, you know, who doesn't have dark thoughts? No, but I you what know? I was going to say was around your age, I really, I had all these things that I was kind of clinging to or ideas and timelines, not so many timelines because my life was such a shit show, but um, I really realized that I had to love myself, yeah. which by the way, 10 years later, I'm still, I would give myself like a C minus. <laughs> But that's coming from an F. <laughs> that so is coming passing. from a. So I'm, it's passing. It's a passing grade. <laughs> Barely passing grade. And some years are better than others. Yeah. Or some months are better than others. Yeah. Or days. It's like I, you just got to break it down. Well, and it sucks being a woman because you're a victim of your hormones. Yeah. So you'll be cruising along and then suddenly it's like that, that what is it in that show? The like hormone monster comes. Oh, yeah. And you're just, it, you mouth. get attacked. Yeah. yeah. Big mouth. It's so funny how they so do that. Great. So how have you managed to keep that optimism? Oh, it's hard. Yeah. You know, I don't really. But you seem so. I don't really think about it in terms of, oh, I've got to be happy. I've got to be happy. I'm very, I'm very self-aware. So I notice when I start to spiral. Yeah. And when I start to spiral, you know, I'll reach out to you. I'll reach out to my sister. I'll Mm -hmm. reach out to some of my friends and just kind of, you know, be like, I need help. Yeah. So it's like, I feel like you can't be afraid to ask for that. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as just kind of like being overall positive, I mean, I feel like I've just kind of always been that way. Yeah. But like, look, like yesterday, or not yesterday, but a couple of days ago, I was going to write in my gratitude journal. Like I got a gratitude journal. I gave it to you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
because I had a spare one lying around because <laughs> we're white girls. You're so grateful. What's a white girl so... without a gratitude journal? Yeah, right? <laughs> if only Starbucks was open. <laughs> Jesus. I need a pumpkin but... spice scented gratitude <laughs> yeah. journal. And a gel roller pen. But I was going to write in it. And then I was just kind of like, why should I write what I'm grateful for? Because I'm going to lose it anyways. Wow. And my mind kind of went into that like deep, dark place. And then I was aware of it. And I was like, OK, well, I shouldn't really be thinking like this. Right. But, you know, I I kind of just like ruminated on that a bit. Yeah. And just kind of like, OK, let's kind of poke around and see why you feel that way and kind of what's going on. So it's like I am very self-aware in that part of kind of picking around but then i feel like i'll i'll be like that and then i have learned uh, that about living with you yeah everyone has their shit but i also don't know if that's because like you know i'm got like middle eastern blood in me and so it's like little emo girl sometimes Uh, comes out yeah it's a um interesting i'll be like i might be thinking of doing this and you go straight to it's already done yeah (laughs) like the, the like I might be thinking <laughs> That's of the other moving thing. to Arizona and you'll be like, I'm gonna you know, like I guess I'll like, see you when I you're guess in I'm moving to Los Feliz then. <laughs> yeah. It it goes immediately to the and yeah. so I've learned that I have to temper, you know, the like I go m- straight thinking into, out loud plans. Yeah. And I go straight into like catastrophic thinking yeah. like, oh well then the worst is already happening. Yeah. You know, because my mind then goes straight into like doomsday. And the thoughts of it being necessarily like a bad thing, which I understand yeah. that ch- I think I have a trust in change because there's been so much right upheaval and change and constantly. So I don't always like, well, no, I usually like it. I don't always like it. M- m- lately, I like it less, but I I trust that it's usually for the better. Right. For my growth. Right, right. And I feel like with you, (laughs) change equals like death. (laughs) No more change. (laughs) It's just interesting. Everyone has their things because I have the catastrophic thinking, but it's more, you know, I get angry that people around me aren't prepared for the apocalypse. Mm. I'm like, why aren't you? What is your plan for when the like dollar collapses and we need to get out of LA. I right. get legitimately upset that there's not like some kind of thought so going go into this. go kick it with the homies under the 10. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm like, what happens? It's only gonna take a few riots and a few shootings and a few people going crazy before. Then it's martial law and now we can't leave. And mostly I'm mad. I'm thinking that I'm going to be mad that I it, I didn't do something that I knew I should have done. Mm. So like my procrastination will bite me in the ass, which it has. Like organizing your computer. Yeah. <laughs> when it crashes and I lose That's everything. That's going to be the thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be the real riot. <laughs> Maybe we live in like a simulation and if only I could organize my computer, the simulation would be reset, but mm. it's just never going to happen. <laughs> oh boy. You just have to blame this all on you. Oh, Sam, we Ooh. need to do a whole other hour talking about your dates and talking about. So where do you see? I My therapist made me do this the other day and I oh, was laughing. No. Well, because it's a freaking hilarious exercise in the face of a pandemic. OK, where do you see yourself in two years, five years, 10 years? I'm like, I could be roasting rats for food in two months. <laughs> She's like, oh, my God. <laughs> My poor therapist. <laughs> Your therapist needs a she therapist. She just laughs. I'm like, I'm fattening my dog up for as a food source. I think she's doing that for entertainment. This is why Hope <laughs> isn't eating. She's your Hope knows. <laughs> she's charging you to entertain her. <laughs> Pretty much. Hope knows wherever she is. She knows <laughs> that I'm feeding her. Let's see. Two years. I'd like to be producing something. Dumpster fire. A dumpster fire on television. Mm-hmm. Um, five years. I still think we need to get into that scripted world with podcasts. Yeah. Give me so. a script so I can give you notes. And we really need to shoot. And I can shoot. reach out to my people at Spotify. That would be great. We really need to shoot some videos too since mm-hmm. you're home now. Yeah. So where, how have you been affected by this? Uh, well, I work from home. Do you like it? 
I do like it. Okay. You hated it the first week. Well, I hated it the first week. You know, it was really interesting because the first week I was like, this is totally fine. I'm a latchkey kid. Or no, the second week. I got this. (laughs) This is wonderful. I'm a latchkey kid. I'm a latchkey kid. I got this. I can spend all day alone. I'm fine. (laughs) Make myself some microwave mac mac and cheese. (laughs) It's like that day Bridget saw me. I was um, on the couch and I was in my PJs with my legs crossed. What is it, Indian style? Mm-hmm. Can you say that? I don't know if you can say that anymore. My legs you're, are crossed. You're canceled now, Sam. <laughs> Edit that out, Maggie. Edit that out. <laughs> Sam just got canceled. If you haven't been canceled from dumpster fire, <laughs> flaps and folds, I'm pretty sure saying Indian style isn't going to get you canceled. I don't know what... what what yeah, is, we never is, know. Pretzel. My legs are like a pretzel, okay? So I'm Indian sitting, style. <laughs> sitting on the couch. Okay. And I'm watching TV and I'm just like in my Christmas PJs and like eating a snack. And you walk in and you're just like, is this what you look like when you were five? <laughs> <laughs> she did. She looked like she was five. I like made myself a little snack. <laughs> She's <laughs> watching television. <laughs> watching her shit reality shows. It was it was really cute. But then I hated it because then yeah. but the part that I hated, it's so weird because at times I feel like I'm an extrovert and at times I feel like I'm an introverted extrovert, which I guess would still kind of make me an extrovert. You are, as my therapist would define it, is an omnivert. Mm. So what? I go back and forth. Yeah, between you two. go both ways. Yeah. Which is what apparently I am. I have introverted tendencies, but I get energy from people. Mm, introverts yeah. true introverts don't get energy from people no they, love they get this. exhausted by them yeah yeah um and so the thing that i missed was pretty much like i missed the feeling of togetherness you know and just yeah. like going out and not even like going out like you know like party like yeah yeah but just like going out to urban outfitters going to like after work drinks yeah going after work drinks going you know, out to dinner, going to my improv class, just kind of any of that stuff. Like that was the stuff then that I started to really kind of miss. And, you know, going to the movies, yeah. but, you know, like things like that. Like I was like, oh, that's the kind of togetherness that I miss and that I was kind of like yearning for. Yeah. Because when I was, you know, working at my office, I'd come in, you know, I couldn't wait to come back home. But then instead, it's like I've just kind of turned into like this curmudgeon where I'd wake up on the couch, open up my laptop, start working, close my laptop, stay on the couch. Right. And then it was just kind of like, oh, this isn't really fun. There's no space. There wasn't. Yeah, there wasn't anything now for me to you know what it's like. I do not recommend it. In a weird way. Yeah, but you seem to settle back into it. Yeah, because I mean, it's like I'll go to the grocery store. I'll go on walks. Yeah. Other than that, like, that's kind of I'm like, all right. Office culture makes me want to blow my brains out. And I'm, I see people with their little, what are those things they hang around their neck and the. Oh, like a lanyard? Yes, lanyards. I've never I'd, had a weird I lanyard. I go to the darkest place. Even at Craig, I thought CBS for sure you would no. have had a Well, you had like a little security badge. Mm. And that like you would just like, if you left the lot, I you would take that so you could somewhere. scan back in. Right pre-pandemic, I was driving somewhere in Santa Monica and it was right down by where like Viacom and all that shit is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was somebody was like, there was a whole gaggle of people with their lanyards and their cute little like three-quarter pants and their like little work clothes and their Starbucks. And I I was like, I want to kill myself just looking at that. (laughs) Just that corporate Observing that makes me want to to put myself in a casket (laughs) and bury myself alive. (laughs) Like... I just went to the darkest place and I was I think someone was in the car with me and they were like Jesus Christ I was like that whole thing right there made me want to like I don't know what it is but yeah I couldn't do that stuff either yeah I hate any type of like corporate structure I don't really like yeah and I don't know if that's just like the creative in me even though it's like I'm creative business minded yeah you know or I'm like business creative but you're an entrepreneur I think because there's a difference between someone who can climb a corporate ladder and yeah. somebody who is an entrepreneur. Yeah. Because entrepreneurs really are not good at working for other people. Yeah. So you don't, 
you respect authority because yeah. you have your little I bit of a have rule. To. You're not really a rule breaker, but but you do have a that I think entrepreneurial spirit where you would rather be the authority. <laughs> yes. You're like, I'd rather be like, respect my authority. Yeah. <laughs> yes. When I say I respect authority, it's I respect my. my authority. <laughs> I want to be the boss. I am the captain now. I get that. I understand. I think that's that revulsion yeah, to like. I just know better. And some people love it. They love the culture. They love knowing what's expected of them. Like they staff love, meetings. I can't stand staff meetings. They love the pathway, the uh, ladder, all HR, the jockeying. I, I like, I can't, you know, HR. HR. I used to joke all the time on the weed farm. I'd be like, <laughs> you know, like there's just no, not, I'm like, I'm going to report this to HR. <laughs> yeah, they're like, who's HR? <laughs> I, I am HR. Like when some guy grabs your butt in the field, you're like, <laughs> that's it. HR is going to hear from me when the owner of the farm is sexually harassing you. <laughs> I had an old boss, I won't name who, would say, he was like, it's not sexual harassment it's sexy harassment oh god I, you're like actually I just smile and nod because i was like i'm kind of hr but i can't do anything <laughs> you're like that statement is literally sexual harassment <laughs> it was also like she's got big boobs and i was like thank you <laughs> the shit the absolute shit okay well what are what are people will get to know you over the course of time since now we can't really interview that many people. Sam's going to be the guest for the next five weeks. <laughs> you know Sam's intricate life story. I'll just hack into walk and swell and be <laughs> like, talk. This week it's just me. <laughs> just Sam takes over. She's like, the boss now. I'm Bridget. And we're going to interview Sam. Well, thank you, Bridget. How oh, God. You? <laughs> you already do that on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> or so you're just gonna take your Instagram <laughs> shtick to Watkins welcome. Uh tell me what is your biggest defect of character or vice or what however you interpret that. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Hmm. I would say it would be my overthinking. Mm. Yeah. Because that leads to the, you know ultimate like worst case scenario mm -hmm. that leads to my borrowing worry for things that will either never happen or will eventually happen. This is like why Woody not. Allen is your favorite director. <laughs> Used to be. You're still allowed to like his work. <laughs> Annie Hall is really a beautiful He's genius. It's, it's really He's a great not movie. my favorite, but the guy is neurotic and he He's understands. Got, there's a reason why I love him. Love comedy. Yeah. But, you know, it's like that, you know, over, th I think it's what, it's in like the Bhagavad Gita where it's like the the one who can conquer the mind, the mind is their own best friend, mm -hmm. but the one who fails to do so, the mind's the worst enemy. Yep. I was just thinking of the other Buddha quote this morning that to the mind that is still the whole world surrenders. Mm. I love that one. But yeah, so it's just kind of like, it's the overthinking. Yeah. And it's the, you know, and it's struggling with that and trying to figure out like, why do I go to these places? When you overthink, does it, is it primarily about external things and situations or is it directed, like a lot of my overthinking is negative and self-obsessive and like feelings of worthlessness? It's everything. Mm. It's, you know, this person is sick. Are they gonna die in a month? Wow. It's yeah, it goes You're like, like that. my dad's girlfriend. <laughs> okay. My dad's girlfriend goes to bed and she doesn't count sheep. She thinks about the bad things that could happen to everyone she knows, yeah. one person it's after another. It's like fear another. fear fear robbing you of joy. So it's like my mind will go into that, like somebody's sick, are they going to die? And then it'll also kind of go to you know, like I'm dating somebody and I'm like I like them. And then I'm like, I don't know how to express this. Mm. Or I then get in my head and then I'm in my head the entire time. Mm. And then I'm robbed of being in the present moment mm -hmm. and just like appreciating what's happening at that moment. One of my favorite yoga ex expressions that my the woman who certified me in yoga said was that worry is praying to the wrong God. Mm. Yeah. I love that.
That's probably why the Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is so good for, for you in particular. Yeah. It redirects all of that. And I always say this. I was saying this to my sister the other day. I'm like, if you're a creative person and then you're overthinking whether it's hypochondria or anxiety or whatever, that all, in my experience, all of my creative energy when I'm not expressing it, it, mm -hmm. it ends up being used for me to like self-destruct, to yeah. destroy me basically. <laughs> well, and you know, and it's it's kind of interesting because it's like you you need that outlet creatively one you know which is why like for me i was so happy whenever dumpster fire started because you know i do work at a law firm yeah and it's entertainment law so it's still kind of entertainment but you know i wasn't i wasn't working on my script yeah so i didn't have anything that i was actually kind of like writing yeah i'm like 99.9 .9 of producers so i'm like you know like i need a you know a that's what I wanted to work on and do. And I didn't have that outlet. any type of outlet. Yeah. And then it was just like, oh, why don't we just fucking do it ourselves? Well, and I think that it's one thing when, you know, the the whole Sarah Ben and Casa, like real artists have day jobs. And it's one thing exactly. to have a stable day job when you're an artist because it does make creating easier. But if you only have that means to an end and you're not creating, it starts feeling really empty. Yeah. You can deal then with the day job. you start giving up on your, yeah. Then that's when like you're not dreaming big enough. Right. You know? Yeah. Then you just start settling in and you're like, well, okay, I guess we'll just do this. What advice do you have but, for creatives? Oh, boy. That could almost um, be like a whole other podcast. Well, for what? That they're advice in, in, in what though? If you were talking to some young Sam who is 23 years old, mm -hmm. as there are many of them out there right now, and granted the world looks very differently, but what advice would you give them knowing what you know now? What advice would you give yourself knowing what oh, you know boy. now? I mean, create. Yeah. I mean, I hate to sound like a cliche and every other person saying, you just got to create. You just got to create. But it's like you really do. Yeah. I say even if it's even if it's me, you know, being like, I'm going to put on a, a stupid wig and create a voice and record myself on Snapchat doing it and mm -hmm. then turn it into like my little Sandra series. Like mm -hmm. you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra's pretty Sandra. funny. Hi guys! I wish Sandra was on Twitter. <laughs> we could probably do that. Oh God! Sandra would have more followers than me. But no, I would say like Sandra just would have more followers than everyone. I know. <laughs> she had her own Twitter account. Ah, oh, God bless Sandra. We need Sandra to comment on the the world. Oh boy, that would be great. It would be hilarious. Hi guys, <laughs> Sandra. No, I'd say create. I'd say reach out to people. Reach out. You, to you know your creative friends yeah also consume if you can't produce if you can't put out anything then just consume it yep that's one thing that i've really that's the great thing about being in tv <laughs> can justify watching 40 hours of television you mean i can write off netflix research <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I could definitely win some trivia night. It does help, though. But it really does. And then you start watching shows and you start watching films. Yeah. You know, even the really bad ones. You watch them and then you Quentin just Tarantino see. Quentin Tarantino became Quentin Tarantino. You just see everything. You just, you start learning from it. Yeah. You know, and then, and then once, you know, and that was one of the things, because I always kind of felt bad that if I wasn't actively putting out something, that then I was failing on myself. Mm. But then it's like, no, if I, and maybe it's me tricking myself thinking watching 90 Day Fiance is okay. But if it's like, okay, well, then I'm going to watch something and try to learn from it. Or I'm going to, you know, read something and try to learn from it. Then at least at that point, it's like, okay, well, then I'm still feeding that creative side. Yeah. But you can't get stuck. You really at this point have to watch yourself that you're not getting stuck in the rut of like, oh, well, I'm just going to watch all the time and then yeah. never actually do anything yeah never do any output never have any output <sighs> it's a it's struggle tough. it is it is because it requires self-discipline and that is it's challenging that's why i think having people to hold you accountable even like mm -hmm. our fetacy.com community has been so good for me because i've been doing daily check-ins 
And there even like one last night, some guy was like, I am addicted to the internet. I need to be accountable. I need you guys to ask me tomorrow morning if I turned off my phone and vacuum my living room. And I have been there with Twitter. I have been there, as you, you have, know. You have. Where I like, can't stop scrolling. Yeah. And it's just, it helps to have that community that holds you accountable. Yeah. So I think um, finding a mentor, finding a community to hold you accountable. And mm-hmm. people always ask me, they're like, I want to be a writer. What should I do? I'm like, right. Yeah. I don't want to sound cliche, but... That's how I became That's a writer. Really, yeah. It's like, what are you going to do? Say you're a chef and you never cook? Yeah. Then it's like, what? You know, but then also at the same time, too, it's like, if you're not, you know, I feel like creatives tend to need also more, well, maybe not even just creatives. Everybody needs, you need some type of outlet then to also kind of lower you know like quiet the voices in the head yeah you know or make you calm whether if that's chanting whether if that's cooking can be very meditative it's working like playing, out working out playing video games something that gets your mind off of something else mm-hmm. where then you're like okay i have to be in this present moment mm-hmm. you know if i'm thinking about why did you know captain hook have a hook in his hand as i'm cutting carrots and then i chop off my finger you know it's like my mind went off somewhere else i wasn't in the present moment yeah you know or you're playing video games or you're working out and it's like if your mind wanders off you're gonna hurt yourself every ridiculous injury i've had has been that way yeah that's how i broke my toe and sprained my ankle i was not present I was not in in the moment yeah i was like somewhere in my brain and it's good to you know relax your mind in that way while you're doing the other things. Yeah, I've been doing um, Sam Harris's meditation app. Oh, what's that? It's uh, called Waking Up, but he's a neuroscientist, you know, mm-hmm. and he's so brilliant and it's all about, and he went and trained in Tibet and it's it's very focused. He's actually coming on the podcast. I'm so excited, oh, nice. I know, to talk about this because I was like, I have to Can talk to you. Can sign my letters to a Christian oh, nation? He's just so brilliant, but he focuses on... The focus is very much on consciousness. Mm. So it's kind of heady and yeah. trippy because he'll be like, now focus on like, where did that thought come from? <laughs> You're like, I get like, anxiety sometimes. I'm You're like, like, I don't want to think it's too heady. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's, it, he is, ve- it's very science based meditation. Yeah. And he trained, you know, it's some like monk in Tibet or something. Like he got a real grounded training and, but he talks all about that, basically how the mind is all we are. We mm-hmm. are really just balls of consciousness and whatever our thinking is, is going to affect our relationships. Oh, and so totally. being able to be aware of, you know, one of my favorite meditation practices was when you sit quietly and you're meditating and you're focusing on your breath and then inevitably get distracted, you label, and this is kind of the, simple way of doing what Sam has you doing when he's saying kind of focus on your consciousness or focus on that thought. It's just labeling it thinking, Mm. you know, or or judging or whatever. And, And the minute that you can put space between the thought and you, you're no longer identified with that thought. Now you're observing that thought, but then you're like, yeah. but who the fuck is the observer? Well, you know what's <laughs> interesting? So in Michael Singer's book, The Untethered Soul, yeah, he I talks about, and you know, when you're seated kind of in the seat of consciousness. So it's like if you picture your brain mm-hmm. as kind of like a living room and in the middle of your brain is the chair and you're sitting in the chair. So then whenever a thought comes in, you're looking at it in that way. And then you're like, okay, where is this from? And then that's what you said. And what Sam says is, you know, it's putting the space in between. Yep. But it's like you're in your seat of consciousness. But you're who at is it. you in the seat of consciousness? It's pretty meta, right? That's what trips me out. Like, okay, but who the fuck is that? <laughs> and then those moments, it's funny because I have the experience of that silence when you, you know, those, when you get to that state, I'm sure you've reached a chanting when you stop being physical Mm -hmm. like you lose track of where your body ends and the world begins yeah and you suddenly are kind of those like luminous rays of just energy who needs drugs when you can meditate no for real and the in that moment the minute you're aware of it you're out of it yeah but in those moments i get terrified (laughs) because i'm like 
talk about overthinking. I'm like, it's all a lie. <laughs> Everything we think is a lie. Future, past. Wow. When you come like into See, when that I, moment. When I get into that no moment, peace. I'm like, I feel like I'm on a surfboard. Yeah, most people do. Oh, I get, yeah. I'm like, oh, fuck. Everything's a lie. <laughs> everything about the future, everything about the past, it's all bullshit. Like there's o- there is only this present moment. Mm-hmm. And I do think that right now in this time because I can get real fucked up really quickly. Yeah. I wrote like a thousand words last night on Fetacy just draining my brain because when I pull out from the very small circle that I have control over, which is my attitude, my house, my relationships with others. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Yeah. What I put in my body, what I'm consuming, whether it's media or food or uh, other than that, I'm powerless over pretty much everything. There was an earthquake the other night. Yeah. And I have to keep reminding myself to check my anxiety on the earthquake that like the app will go off when it's four and a half or higher. Okay. (laughs) So I... Um. Yeah. There. I. I suddenly start thinking about the pandemic on you know just the mental health level, right. just how it's affecting the people closest to me, and I see people struggling. Then the circle out from the people closest to me. Then the community. Then the city. And I start zooming out to that bird's eye mm. view to like, and then globally, and I get, and then I'm like, and how about it? It gets so confusing and so fucked up and my brain gets so loud and I have been using meditation. I've been meditating like three times a day because it's the only thing that I can do. Like you said, we're all just sitting with ourselves. Yeah. And I'm I'll like go and I'll drive myself insane. Yeah. I'll go crazy. I don't want to end up in a straitjacket in the end of this. But if I let my brain just like run loose and free the way it wants to. I will. <laughs> Brain is a dangerous neighborhood. It's the freaking Calvin and Hobbes cartoon that's yeah. my favorite, where he's sitting at the top of the hill and he's looking, and this actually pertains more to you even than me, but he's sitting at the top of the hill on a sled and he's like, you won't, his brain, he has a thought bubble. It's like, you won't hit those trees. Don't worry, you'll miss that rock. You won't go off the ledge. And then he looks out at us, the audience, and he's like, my brain is trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> like that. That is my brain. Do you think Calvin and Hobbes is like Joe Exotic and it's tigers? No. <laughs> Never ever make that comparison again. Look how quickly that fell out of the news cycle. I know. The blob, man, it's remediated. It really the blob is. absorbed it. Meme. The minute anything becomes a meme, it's, it's the blob. Done. Yeah, the blob has yeah. absorbed it. Oh, Sam, what's your biggest asset? Bridget, Bridget. Hmm. I would say, I guess I would say my support mm. or nurturing. My, not even just nurturing, but. You're very nurturing. I am very nurturing. Um, that's a rare quality in people, but I would say, I would say my, I guess I would say my support in terms of like, if I'm on your side, you know, then it's like, I'm on your side, we're going to get it done. Like I'm going to do whatever I can. You're loyal. I'm loyal. Yeah. So it's like, you know, when it came to dumpster fire, it's like, yes, let's do it. Let's produce it. Let's do it. You know, so it's like the minute then I'm on your side, and, and I'm supporting you in something, it's like, I'm going to make it happen. Mm-hmm. This is very Arab. I feel like there's another side to that that I wouldn't want to be on. <laughs> <laughs> there are two types I'm of people. Like, there feels like <laughs> there's another side of that that I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> if you wrong me, I will never support yeah, you. Yeah, I will cut you. Um, Out of my circle. You are loyal and compassionate and nurturing. You know, I think mm-hmm. that, I do think that, my sisters all adore you. They I are like, them. they wonderful. just think you are the sweet. They all say the same thing. They go, Sam is the sweetest little spirit in the entire See, world. Maybe I'm too sweet. No, there's maybe no such gotta thing. gotta be a little sassy. I did have someone tell me that in a past life, I was more the sacrificial virgin that they would throw into the volcano. I can see that. I can actually kind of <laughs> see that too. I'm, I'm like, don't be so pure. Yeah. <laughs> 
Even when you, I feel like you're kind of like me in that respect, though, even not that I'm anywhere near as pure as you, but there is something goofy and nerdy and dorky about both of us that Mm -hmm. when I used to go to Vegas with women, I would feel, I'm like, I feel like a fucking, yeah, ten. I felt like I was 10 years old when all the girls transitioned and I was still wearing my onesie, like my... (laughs) When I still was looking like a 10 or 11 year old and all the girls were already like in 12 and 13 years, I I just was like still playing with Barbies at 13. Well, I just remember too, it's like when I went, one of my friends, um, I was not a bachelorette. What do you call it? When not a maid of honor, a bridesmaid. Bridesmaid. I was a bridesmaid in her wedding and she had her bachelorette party in San Diego Mm. and Everybody they was getting around there. Did they do the dick necklaces? No. Okay, thank God. Or I didn't get one. <laughs> they did. <laughs> They're like Sam's a drag, right? <laughs> Everyone gets a dick necklace, but Sam. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, where's my dick necklace? <laughs> this is why your date suck. They're like, listen, Sam. You don't too, know how to say You're this. too sweet and innocent. You look like you're five over there. I don't want to see you drink your daiquiri out of a dick straw. <laughs> I would never give you a dick necklace. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. <laughs> but, but yeah, so they're all like wanting to go out to the club. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll put on a dress too and heels and go out and... <laughs> Then it's like they'd go to the pool and they're all drinking and it's like I'll have like a drink or two, but I'm also like eating a cheeseburger, <laughs> drinking some water. And I was like, yeah, I'll have another hot dog, please. And I'm like eating food. And they're just like doing lines in the just, bathroom. And they're just like doing shots. And then the next day, it's like I'm feeling fine. I woke up. I This was back when I was running. I woke up. I went like. I ran four miles, came back to the hotel. They're all like throwing up. And they're like, we think we were roofied. And I'm like, no, dumbass. You just drank. You were in the sun. You didn't have any water. You didn't have any food. I was like, we literally had the same thing, except I had food I and ate. water. I think I was roofied. They were like, I think we were roofied. And I was like, no, no. You're like, no. Unless it's a Dick Straw story again. No and roofing <laughs> you guys. Trust me. <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, I think we're both both dorks. I felt yeah. that way even when we first went out to the um, like comedy places together and mm-hmm. we were hanging out and I was like, never going to be cool enough for these people. <laughs> I'm just never going to be cool enough for the comedy world. And I'm just dorky enough that they're like, okay, we'll accept we'll you. We'll accept you. You're acceptable. We'll send you my script. I'll send you my script once I'm done writing it. Well, we have a dumpster fire coming this week. Woot woot. After a long hiatus and sickness, it will be an it'll be an eight hour dumpster fire. <laughs> trying to ke- catch up. We're actually going to shoot it in a dumpster, and Bridget's going to be on fire. Everything's become so on the nose that it's so hard. Even the like little creepy pandemic jingle that we have and the unicorns dance while the world burns Ugh, the chive is sending selling dumpster fire candles now Bastards. i wonder what it smells like probably remember what i wanted to make it's the chive it's like probably smells like nut sack juice uh, <laughs> gross <laughs> remember when i wanted to make that dick candle yeah that was like three weeks ago yeah <laughs> Cool. Back when cool. the back when the world was great normal. story. Great story. Sam. Where can we find you, Sam? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram <laughs> at Bridget <laughs> <Fetis-y>. <laughs> There's a little bit more action on my page, <laughs> though. Bridget loves to comment on all my pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and hopeful boxer and hopeful boxer um no but you can find me on twitter and instagram uh at samantha shahi mm-hmm. s-a-m-a-n-t-h-a-s-h-a-h-i okay yeah and you can find her on dumpster fire oh yeah and dumpster fire I go by sammy flaps and folds sammy flaps and folds i'll let you figure out why <laughs> <laughs> 
actually forgot how that happened. Um, oh, who even knows? Vulva. I was talking about vulvas they have to and watch. the flaps and the folds. You have to binge watch Dumpster Fire in order to really understand our dorky, silly side. Well, Sam, thank you for sitting down with me. Of course, Bridget. I love you. I love you. You're pretty much a sister, exactly <laughs> like my sisters. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> you're pretty you're pretty much family at this point. You're family too. <laughs> yeah. I love you so much. Love you. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and cousin Maggie. Hello, Bridget. Hello, Maggie. Once Hi, again, we're doing a I don't even know what the word is, a virtual check-in. It sounds windy there. That's because I've got a fan blowing directly at me because so. it's so hot. <laughs> I'm like, do you have a door open? Or? Yeah, the door and windows open and the fan is on. Because Don't you have AC? I do, but it's not quite hot enough to justify turning on the AC. No, we had it on today. Mm. Whatever. It's like a, ours is like a swamp cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, mine is, you know, this place is like a sieve. So I usually only use it when it's really, really bad, but maybe I'll use it later to cool the place down. How you doing? I'm good. I'm living my best quarantine life. Finally. How are you? Good. At last one day. Did you make a sourdough that turned out? I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It came Except out well. it was like a miracle that it turned out because I overproofed it, which is, it's like science. It's mm-hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm just determined. I don't even eat the bread. I end up giving it all away. (laughs) But that one actually came out okay. And then the second one, which I thought was going to be perfect, was kind of flat. It's still edible and good, but it wasn't, it didn't get that like lift. Mm. And there are two times, I think I am in it for the excitement because there's, after you with sourdough, after you put it in the Dutch oven, you have to wait 20 minutes and you can't open it and you have no <laughs> idea if it worked. <laughs> Especially for like a newbie like me. So right. You get to open it and then you're like, woohoo, it lifted or it didn't. And that's the high you're chasing. <laughs> that's the days. high I'm chasing. <laughs> but then there's a second high because then you have to wait a freaking hour for the bread to cool because you can't slice into the precious sourdough before it cools down or the bubbles, something happens chemically and then it gets gummy. So you have to wait until it cools down. And so then you slice into it and you get to see if there's like bubbles or if it's a disaster, which a lot of mine have been disasters. Wow. Who knew? I never knew sourdough was such a I had no idea. I was laughing so hard talking to my old sponsor because she and I are on the same journey. I'm just like three weeks behind her, our sour, my sourdough journey. And she started it because it was something she always wanted to learn. I started it because I've always been intimidated by it, but we, we both kind of came to this conclusion. And it's just something, you know, it's a challenge to kind of throw yourself into at a time when you can't do much. And so, and I think there is something primal about it. So she's like one week into it. I was like, what the fuck was I thinking? (laughs) I'm like, yeah, that was me. But then she gave me her recipe and she said, I've actually like gone through a bunch of, because nobody does it the same way. Uh Every single person has a different way. Right. You come up with your own tweak technique kind of thing. Bananas. And it's, yeah. it's very finicky. I did not realize it's all about the temperature and all about the freaking like, and then you can overproof it, which I didn't really realize what that meant until last night when I went to go take. So the whole process is insane. And especially if you're making your own starter first you in your own starter is before we had dry activated yeast, which is apparently only 150 years old. I've learned Uh we would use active starters, which is essentially take 30 grams of flour, 30 grams of water, mix it together, let it set. Next Uh day, feed it again, take some out because it eats all the food up, let it set. Five days later, you You have have something you can use for yeast. Yeah. That's crazy. Then you have to add the starter to the water and then you add the flour and then you have to let it auto lease which is when it sits for an hour and then you have to do this whole flap and fold process where every half an hour i like this process because it's kind of cool and meditative but you like 
take the dough and fold it, and that's what creates the gluten structure. So then you're just strengthening the dough. Then you let it call, it's the bulk fermentation, which is when all the starter like puffs up and it creates all the bubbles. And that's dodgy because if you don't do it enough, you get a flat bread. And if you do it too much, what happened to me last night is that it's like goo dough soup and it doesn't hold its shape because basically what happened is all the carbon dioxide destroyed all the gluten structure oh my God. <laughs> because it was proofing too long or it's too hot or who freaking knows. So then I just put it in the fridge and I was like, I'm going to bake it because now this is a science experiment and I want to see. And it actually came out really well. Huh. So weird. Well, it's so funny because there's a, in one of the Little House on the Prairie books, they talk about making a sourdough starter. Like they talk about I know. How, how to start it. And like Ma makes it sound like the easiest fucking thing in the world. They all do. <laughs> By the way, every single video, and this is what my old sponsor and I were laughing about. She's like every single video, they're like, and then you just do this. But every step of the process, even getting, even handling the dough is hard to do. Mm-hmm. And it's, I'm sure I'm boring all of our listeners to tears, but it's, it's honestly like fascinating. And then everybody's been kind of shitting on everyone making bread and they're like, oh, this is the most bougie like way to deal with. I, I think most of Chen was giving people shit and saying like, I can't believe I didn't know the apocalypse would include so many pictures of bread, which is, I think it's just people like looking for something to do. But I'm like, obviously you've never tried to make sourdough because it's freaking hard. Right. It's a challenge. And yeah. It, it, there is something primal about it too. It's like bread is like the basic, one of the basic oldest things that we made and eat and humans. And it's I've very, gone down that rabbit hole too. To be able to make your own bread, I think is very kind of like, okay, I can survive a little bit better, you know, oh. in, in the apocalypse. <laughs> I'm like probably two weeks away from getting my own mill <laughs> so like you know you can get like a little one <laughs> and you're gonna start milling your own flour <laughs> just getting the grains and milling my own flour I love, I love it I mean I helped my mom clean out the pantry when I was home last whatever last time I was home and they, she had a couple of like coffee drip you know, things that you put the old filter in and, and she had a couple of them. And I was like, well, just save one in the event of the apocalypse. She was like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> it's just one of those things where you're like, if you have it or if you know how to use it or whatever, just keep it around because you never know. I I enjoy it. Though. Yeah. I just hate, you know, me hating to waste food. So every time one doesn't come out, I'm like, ugh. Uh-huh. And flour is such like a precious item right now that it, if it's not working, but I think it's just also making a lot of it. You just have to like keep doing it. And I'm, I'm just, I'm stubborn and uh, I'll probably, it's my new sponsor today. He said, he's like, I have a feeling you're just going to get really good at it and then never make bread again. Yeah. <laughs> I bet. I bet you're stubborn when it comes to shit like this though. You're like determined to perfect it. I will learn. I also started doing my Spanish lessons again. Ooh, look at you go. So, and I did my first Zoom yoga class today, which was really weird. Huh. Did you teach it or did you? No, I participated because I just wanted to be held accountable. I signed up for one because I wanted to be held accountable to doing it. Mm. And it was donation. It was good. It was just weird. Yeah, I bet. It's weird too because I'm a yoga instructor and I'm like, I I don't need to be, I don't need a screen to do this. Right. I can just do this. Right. But it's the doing it. (laughs) <laughs> how are you doing mag i've been struggling but i don't know like it's just there are good days and bad days there it's i've lately just been like it's like trying to hold back the tide with a broom sometimes some days and it's just like okay you know like everything contrary action everything i can do blah 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 me, me, me. but i i you know this i've decided to get a dog yeah. And I'm excited I'm about that. I think that's a really good idea. And I've been just kind of tinkering with the idea forever. Just be like, yeah, I want a dog. I've wanted a dog for a long time, but I've always been like, it's not quite the right time. It's not quite blah, blah, blah. And now I'm just like, I really fucking think I need a dog. So yeah. 
I found one online on in a shelter and uh, or being fostered and applied for it. Still haven't heard back, but the application process can take a while because it's all volunteer based. Yeah. So hopefully we'll see. And then if mm -hmm. I don't get that dog, then I'll look around for another one. But I uh, think it's great. Quarantine process has slowed everything down too. Yeah. I'm excited though. It's, it's a good like decision to have made in my mind and, and be like, all right, I've, um, something to something to look forward to. Hope saved my life, as we know. Yes, little Hoper Dopers. How she? Because I was, she's friggin' hilarious. I think she knows I'm fattening her up for the apocalypse. Uh huh. She's not eating. She's only eating one meal a day. She's <laughs> like, no way. I know I what you're doing. You at all. <laughs> no, she's good. She seems like she's just she's hopey dopey. Yeah, that's good. No, in there. I need a little creature to love and to get me out and to, you know, all the stuff dogs do. And I love dogs. Yeah. It's hard. It's definitely, uh, they force you to walk yeah. twice a day, you know, right. <laughs> at least and just something, uh, cute and entertaining and fun and something yeah, to another take present. care of. Yeah. Something to yeah. take care of that forces you to like, think about something else. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I am all for it, as you know. So here's hoping. Everyone keep your fingers crossed. I get the little dog I selected because he's really cute. He is cute. Uh-huh. That's exciting. I hope you do. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I've got to I've gotta go back on, into the Phetasy community. I haven't been in there at all because I've just been like, I avoid when I when I get yeah. depressed. <laughs> when you get depressed, do you just stare at the ceiling or do you do, do you just watch TV? What do you, or read? Like, what do you do? Uh, all of those things do. just like kind of distract, just like I'll, I'll go down a rabbit hole of like whatever it may be like YouTube videos or a show or whatever. But I've been like doing my, I've been working, which is good. Um, not as like, it's, I don't know. Everything seems to take longer. It's like your brain is a little weird and not it, focusing is harder. Like mm -hmm. it's weird too. My sleep is all fucked up. I, I used to, when I was really depressed in my twenties, I slept all day and all the time. Mm -hmm. And now I have insomnia. I haven't mm -hmm. been sleeping very much at all. So it's, it's like the opposite, but I've definitely experienced insomnia with depression too. So we'll see. It's fine. I'm just trying to, like I said, keep stringing good good and okay days together mm. and to be honest about it to be open mm. about it which is hard mm. but also like one of my biggest signs is I I hide it so yeah yeah yes this is where I sometimes realize thank god I have I'm like in recovery mm -hmm. because I could hide if I wanted to, but I can't really hide. Mm -hmm. Even if I, even just because I'm a secretary of one stinking meeting a week and I have mm -hmm. to show up and be, but I, I definitely been going to more, more than one a week this week. And obviously I, I was saying like, Oh, it's not a weird accident when I was talking to Sam, just that I feel better. Right. And I but definitely, I don't, yeah, no, go ahead. I don't want to do those things. Right. <laughs> it's, it's like I was saying to Sam, like, yeah, it's still just the doing it. <laughs> right. No, it's definitely like there are some days where I can make myself do the shit I know I need to do and I do feel better. And then there are some days I can't, but, mm -hmm. or I don't and whatever, maybe I can, but I just don't. And, mm -hmm. um, but I went on a walk the other day and was, or yesterday and was just calling friends I know who are living alone and like mm -hmm. one of them's fine and is like totally like woohoo. And then the other one was, is struggling too. Like, mm -hmm. she's, like definitely like me. She's like, my schedule's all fucked up. She's like, my dog is so mad at me cause I'll take him for walks at two in the morning. And <laughs> wow. It's just like, you know, she, it's hard. It is hard. It's definitely not natural. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that's one of the things that I was writing about on fantasy last night was just the, how do you balance all these things that are seemingly impossible to balance the actual health of our vulnerable communities, the economic impact this is having on everybody, our most, and again, our poorest are going to suffer the most. Mm -hmm. And also the mental health aspect. Yeah. I mean, I was asking 
uh, I got a juice today and I was asking the guy who, um, how his daughter's doing as a 12 year old. And he said, not good. You know, he's like, they're, they're, they're so social at 12 and she's just, a, she's a straight A student and she hates doing zoom classes and she's not right. And so I wonder what the impact is on, you know, teenagers and kids who are, I don't know. Yeah. It's just the ripple effects of something like this are just so, and that's where my brain goes is I start tripping out when like every single thread, I'll right. follow one thread and then another, right. and another. Like, and oh God, this consequence and that consequence and all this stuff. But it's also like we've talked about, this is apocalypse light, you know, like this is pandemic light. This is for now, for now, but it could be like so much more deadly or so much more like, and this is still hard enough. So we should like, I try, I'm just trying to like, my fucking blessings and gratitude yeah. and all the stuff. But. <laughs> Sam and I talked about gratitude in the podcast and we were like, what, what kind of white girl are you if you don't have a gratitude journal? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. I think it's definitely at that point where everyone's like, I'm fucking over it. Yeah. Not that they weren't in the beginning, but I, I, it's, I, I don't know how you're going to keep LA locked down the hotter it gets. No, I know. That's, I had a, was talking to a friend who was like, I heard a rumor that they're going to open the beaches and the, the trails next weekend because it's going to get really hot. And I was like, it, there will be riots in LA if you try and keep people inside when it's By really the hot. way, it does. And this is what I was saying on Twitter yesterday. It affects the poorest communities the most. Uh-huh. You don't think, you think that this affects people with pools and yards? Yeah. No. No. It's the people who live in urban areas or people who live in apartments on top of each other. You can't, they, the basketball courts are closed. Like people need to be able to go outside. I know. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. Or you will have riots in LA. And then I go down the rabbit hole of, okay, what are the signposts that I need to get the fuck out of Dodge and before there's martial law in LA and you can't leave? Right. Because that's my biggest fear is that there's, it, it would only take a couple of robberies, riots, and shootings before they locked everyone in this city down and now you can't leave and you're that's stuck in LA. Summer's coming. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'd be so mad because I'd be like, I freaking know it. I knew I should go out. And there was that earthquake two nights ago, which was, I mean, my place is, it's on the second floor and below, yeah. me, is, below me is just garages. And every time there's an earthquake, I'm like, uh, my place could very easily collapse. Like there's nothing below me that other than empty space. And it's just like, Uh, that one was jolting it was definitely like jolting because it was close and it wasn't even that big but I was like okay like that one freaked me out I there's something about the earthquakes I usually like I don't know the more time goes by the more freaked out I get by them oh god I read I was Joan Didion is my soul sister I read a passage last night I'm gonna post it on fantasy tonight Joan Didion talks about in this passage how she loves earthquakes because she couldn't find faith in God. She found it in geology Mm. because of the, and it's the same stuff that I'm always writing, how just the endless turning of time and knowing that the earth will keep, the sands will keep being eroded and that that like the mountains will rise and fall and, and all of this, this sense of kind of your place in the world, but she's just such a brilliant writer. And I read this, I'm like, I could have written this 40 years from now. Cause it's, you know, uh-huh. she's like a brilliant writer and it's so crazy. Cause she talked about how she liked earthquakes, even though that they scared her, that she enjoyed them on some primal level because they like put her in her place. <laughs> it definitely is. It like makes you think about like, wow, like that, that, that's the earth moving. Like that's, we're so small, mm-hmm. and, but that's what I've been watching that, um, that National Geographic thing produced by Darren oh, Aronofsky, yeah. One Strange Rock, which is the one, one of those things where it's like all the interconnected systems on our planet. Which it's is bonkers. Crazy. And it, it's just really well done and <laughs> beautifully like shot. So I've only watched like the first two episodes, but it's so good. And it's narrated by Will Smith. That's right. Well, and it's if you, the, if you can deal with Will Smith, then I love you, him. You'll enjoy it. 
And it's the thing that always gives me an existential crisis when I go do my taxes because they play it. That's how we discovered it. They play it in our tax guys waiting room. And I sit there. I had to wait for three hours once. And it was all about the cosmos and like the meaning. And I was like, what is the point? By the time Maggie showed up. (laughs) Why am I doing my fucking taxes? Yeah. I'm like, this is such a weird thing to be put, like playing in a tax waiting room where it's like the, the paradox of this is the most gonna- mundane thing in the world. I love, I know it's so, it's so good and so well done. And, but just all the systems and it's just crazy. And I love mm. how they basically, it's from, they interview a bunch of astronauts who mm-hmm. all have like experience looking mm-hmm. at their, like if you have that perspective of earth below you, it just changes the way That's you nuts. See the world yeah at forever yeah and just like kind of their interviews are really interesting so yeah it's really yeah. cool i would definitely recommend it one strange rock go find it it's on disney plus and i think you said it's on netflix too yeah some of the seasons are definitely on netflix because that's where i was watching it well we're talking yeah. about the cosmos in the apocalypse. It is weird. That- place in the universe. <laughs> grain of sand moments. Grain of sand moments. It is strange that our <laughs> we ended up like shifting into an apocalypse. Every <laughs> week I'm like, where do we go from here if we're in the apocalypse? I know. It's like a then apocalypse recovery. I need <laughs> to be in society. Yeah. I'll just be the bread baker. Bread baker. At least I'll have a scout. Now Such I want a to- bread baker. Now I'm going to start a pandemic garden. <laughs> I'm thinking of doing a big garden. Why not? That's good. <laughs> Except for the fact that Hope might rip it up. Out of rage. Uh-huh. My dog, my, or our dog growing up, he used to, like, his favorite thing in the world was running through my mom's garden and kind of tearing up the flowers because he just, he loved it so much. Little Willie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do we have anything else to promote or talk about? Go to fetacy.com, guys. Yeah. It's such a good community. I'm, it's saving me. I'm like exactly. living in there. I've got to get back in there. I, this is total classic avoidance for me. I'm just mm. like, it's, and it's also too, I'm like, is this my social media thing? Like the second I joined, I was like, bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's also depression. Although I don't, yeah, I think it's more because there's not very, the thing that I like the most about fetishy is that at least, now because it's so nascent and early and it's just our own little world there isn't so much the ability to compare and despair Mm -hmm. so on facebook and instagram and even twitter there's that ability to look at someone's numbers look at someone's reach look at somebody's new job you're kind of always aware of your place in in things or you're you're seeing everybody else's life and it's true. this feels a lot more like an actual community support group called the totally is it's a very like friendly supportive place which i love i loved like creeping on it and checking it out and um i think it's also just me i put pressure on myself where i'm like i need to respond i need to like do that and and I'm just like I'm avoiding it like I it's classic classic avoidance for me so well you can start by still avoiding everyone and loading the podcast into the content section <laughs> that's true um I was I was gonna ask you that do I do I load it differently now that it's there's a content section or do I just keep I because usually it's just I make a post or you make the post for no, you can load the actual file up to Fetacy. Oh. Just like dumpster fire. Does it take audio files only? Yeah. Really? There's a whole audio section. Okay. All right, I'll check it out. I think you probably would just take the podcast that you upload to Ricochet and upload it there. Okay. And if you don't want to do it, I can. I just need to know where they are. No, I can do it. That's easy. As long Because uh, that way I can just load it once it's done. Because this, and they'll get it a little early. That would be great. The ricochet people. I mean, sometimes I'm not done until like two in the morning, so they'd get it like three hours before it launches live. But yeah, so. this one with Sam was fun. She's just so cute. Good. I'm excited to listen to it. So, how is everyone else doing out there? Is there anyone alive out there? We're doing a dumpster fire this weekend. But yes, we are. 
we're getting back into it now that we're just no longer got the COVID. <laughs> I'm ready. Everyone take care of yourselves out there. Yep. Stay safe. Stay sane. Email us. Yeah. We love you. We love you. Bye. Bye. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>